Good afternoon and welcome to today's Finance Committee meeting. My name is Councilmember Danny Drum and I'm the chair of this committee. We've been joined today by Council Members Cohen, Council Member Gibson, Council Member Powers, Council Member Moya, Council Member Matteo, and Council Member uh, Grudenchik. Today's hearing will examine the impact of the city on the city of the Federal Tax Cut and Jobs Act, or TCJA, signed into law by the President in December of last year. This legislation, the largest tax overhaul in 30 years, sharply cut taxes for businesses and high-income individuals while reducing revenues by $1.5 trillion over the next decade. The law made noteworthy changes to important deductions, including eliminating personal exemptions, establishing a new pass-through deduction, reducing eligibility for the mortgage interest deduction, and of particular importance to the city, capping the state and local tax or SALT deduction. I want to first echo the concerns of both Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio that this law disproportionately harmed New York State and its residents. Perhaps the most significant example of this in the limited limitation placed on the SALT deduction. Prior to the new act, New Yorkers had the option to fully deduct state and local individual income taxes as well as property taxes off of their federal taxes. This reduced the effective cost of their state and local taxes. However, the TCJA now places a limit of $10,000 on the deduction. The governor has expressed concern that this may result in greater tax migration, an issue I hope to explore further with our experts today. As I noted, the act is also projected to reduce federal revenues by $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years, increasing the federal deficit. Based on the priorities of the President and the Republican Congress, the burden of future deficit reduction will likely fall on the backs of our most vulnerable citizens. As these tax cuts increase, the wealth of the city is wealthiest individuals. These cuts should not be paid for by reduced funding for the programs relied on by low and middle income families. At this time of massive inequality, this is the wrong direction for our country. There are a variety of measures and legal changes that could be implemented in order to blunt the impact of the CCJA on New York State and New York City and their residents. Many have already been outlined by Governor Cuomo in both the Department of Taxation and Finance's preliminary report on the Act and the su subsequent 30-day amendments to the 2018-19 state budget legislation. The proposals in the report include the creation of charitable funds to, re to receive taxpayer contributions, the establishment of a statewide employer compensation expense tax, and the decoupling of the state's tax law from various federal provisions. I would note that the 30-day amendments included most, but not all, of the decoupling proposals offered in the Department's report. These proposed changes affect New York City's personal income tax, business taxes, and real property tax, as well as their New York State equivalents. Today, the committee looks forward to discussing these potential reforms with the administration and the experts from business, academia, and other areas. As the state considers its responses to the law, it is vital that the council be an informed voice to advocate effectively on behalf of the people of the city of New York. We'll begin with testimony from Michael Hyman, the first deputy commissioner of the Department of Finance. Deputy Commissioner Hyman is joined by Francesco Brin Brindisi, deputy director at the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, and Joshua Goldstein, assistant director at OMB. And maybe I missed one person. <laughs> Zal Kumar from the Department of Finance as well. Uh, okay, and uh, with that, I'm going to ask counsel to swear in the um, witnesses. You affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief. Yes. <coughs> okay. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the Committee on Finance. As you said, I am Michael Hyman, first Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Finance, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Zal Kumar, Director of Business Tax Services, and Sheila Feinberg, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. Also at the table is Francesco Brindisi, Deputy Director for the City's Office of Management and Budget. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the local fiscal impact of the recently enacted Federal Tax Act. In December, Congress passed and the President signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which made the most significant changes to the U.S. tax code since the 1980s. The new Federal Tax Act affects both individual filers and corporations. As others have noted, the new law hurts many states and local municipalities, and New York City is no exception. 
With its major changes to the federal corporate tax and the state tax, the new Federal Tax Act in particular benefits businesses and high-income households, which own the largest estates and receive the bulk of income from passive investments, like real estate, stocks, and bonds. It's important to note that the corporate tax law changes are permanent, while the personal income tax benefits expire in 2025. The increases in federal standard deduction amounts and reductions in the federal tax rate structure will help some New Yorkers, but the overall average benefit is small. The fact is that many New York City taxpayers receive little or no benefit from the income tax provisions of the Federal Tax Act. My testimony will highlight the law's effects on individuals, businesses, and the revenues collected by New York City and state. I will also describe proposed actions at the state level to counter the most harmful flow through aspects of the law. DOF and the OMB have prepared an initial fiscal analysis of the impact of the Federal Tax Act. First, the law's impacts on individuals and families. Our models, fed by federal, state, and city data, estimates that about 25% of city filers will receive no federal personal income tax cut, 10% will receive an increase, and 37% will receive a cut of less than $20 per week. The no law limits the state and local tax deduction to $10,000, eliminates personal exemptions, lowers federal tax rates, including the rate for the highest income filers and favoring pass-through income over earned income, stretches brackets, increases the standard deduction, restricts or eliminates certain itemized deductions, expands child and family tax credits, and eliminates the alternative minimum tax for most taxpayers. DOF and OMB predict that the com combined impact of the provisions I have cited will increase federal taxes an average of 8% on hundreds of thousands of New York City residents, the majority of whom have income below $100,000. A primary reason for this increase in the tenth is the $10,000 limit on the SALT deduction. IRS data shows that Manhattan is the top county nationwide in terms of SALT deductions, with an average deduction of almost $24,000, well above the new limit and New York ranks second in SALT deductions claimed among all states. This coupled with other limitations on itemized deductions and an increase in the standard deduction means that about 68% of current itemizers will no longer do so. Indeed, among those New Yorkers who we predict will see the increased federal liability, almost all currently itemize. In general, the federal deductibility of state and local taxes dates back to the beginning of the federal income tax system and has been a fundamental component of fiscal federalism in the nation's history. The Federal Tax Act undermines this important component of public fiscal policy. In addition to the impact on federal liability of city residents, we also studied the impact on New York City and New York State liability. Similar to most states and localities, New York's tax system piggybacks on the federal system for tax administration reasons. Because our tax calculation starts with federal taxable income, when the federal definition is changed, city and state revenue is impacted. Our models found that the combination of federal tax changes would increase New York City personal income tax revenue for 1.8 million city taxpayers by $320 million. This group would also pay an additional $550 million in New York state taxes. These increases are primarily due to the flow through impact of federal law changes that reduce the New York standard deduction available to single filers. City taxpayers would also see local increases due to their lost ability to itemize on the federal return. Currently, state law allows taxpayers to itemize only if they do so on the federal return. The administration is concerned about these impacts and, as I will discuss, supports measures to protect city residents. Fewer than 1% of New York City taxpayers would see a reduction in city liability from the flow through of federal provisions. These taxpayers benefit from the more generous treatment of medical expenses for 2017 and 2018 only, and the repeal of existing limits on itemized deductions for certain high-income taxpayers. The Federal Act also makes changes to the federal estate tax. The estate tax exemption is now doubled from $5.6 million to $11.2 million, reducing estate tax revenues by approximately 40%. We estimate that the reduction of the amount of federal estate tax paid annually by wealthier New York City taxpayers will total approximately $400 million. Now let's look at how the law will affect businesses based or operating in New York. The Federal Tax Act changes many aspects of business taxes, including lowering the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21 percent, lowering the tax rate on pass-through income tax at the individual level, establishing a new system for the tax treatment of multinational corporations, modifying net operating loss treatment, and repealing the corporate alternative minimum tax. 
DOF and OMB have evaluated each provision to determine whether it will impact the city's business income tax revenue. As with the individual tax, only changes to taxable income can flow to the city. Federal rate and credit changes will not directly impact our corporate tax revenue. While we are still determining the revenue impact on city business income taxes, we have, have, have identified several highly significant provisions. The deemed repatriation income provisions in the Federal Tax Act will require corporations to report additional income at the federal level, but this income is generally not included in New York's tax base. However, certain deductions related to the income may be included, resulting in a potential revenue loss. In contrast, certain interest expenses related to repatriated income may be allocated in such a way as to reduce the expenses against business income, thereby increasing our tax base and revenue. There are also a host of less significant provisions which may flow through, some of which may increase and some of which may reduce business income revenue. The analysis is complicated by the fact that the city imposes entity level taxes on flow through businesses, such as S corporations and partnerships while the federal government taxes all, through, all flow through income only at the individual level. We will, be further, we will further explore this impact on the city's business income taxes and are committed to closing loopholes that create a risk of revenue loss. Now let's look at the effects of the tax cut and the president's proposed fiscal, fiscal year 19 budget on city residents and the New York City budget. The Federal Tax Act also has a direct and negative impact on the city budget. For example, the Act eliminated tax-exempt advance refunding bonds, which may cost up to $425 million in savings over the next four years, and increased the cost of repairing roads, bridges, and other critical infrastructure. Indirectly, lowering the corporate tax rate to 21% devalues low-income housing tax credits, which could impact our affordable housing plan by some $200 million annually. New Yorkers will be directly harmed as well, the bill repealed the Affordable Care Act individual mandate, a key component of the ACA, which helps keep health insurance coverage available and affordable for 4.2 million New Yorkers who benefit from subsidized insurance coverage. The tax bill is projected to cause large federal budget deficits. As a response, we can expect to see proposals that cut the federal budget to close the deficit. Just this month, President Trump released his proposed fiscal Fiscal year, federal fiscal year 19 budget, which cuts hundreds of millions of dollars from programs that help some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers, including drastic cuts to Medicaid, a program that cares for 3.5 million New Yorkers, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program that helps 1.64 million low-income New Yorkers, education assistance that supports universal pre-K and other programs, community development block grants, which are designed to help low and moderate income New Yorkers, the Public Housing Capital Fund, which NYSHA uses to modernize its developments, and Section 8 vouchers, which supports low-income New Yorkers in public housing. We are working with our partners in Washington to fight cuts to services which benefit some of our most vulnerable residents. Now let's look at the state response. On February 15, the governor released his 30-day amendments to help address some of the concerns for personal income tax filers and for New York State's economy. The 30-day amendments introduced proposals to prevent certain provisions of the Federal Act Tax Act from flowing through to New York's tax system, including allow residents to itemize in New York returns whether or not they itemize in federal returns, continue the calculation of New York deductions as before the Federal Tax Act, restore the New York single filer standard deduction. The personal income tax provisions also affect the city's personal income tax and the city supports preventing the flow through of federal personal income tax provisions that would increase the personal income taxes of New York City residents. In the 30-day amendments, the governor also included a New York payroll tax proposal and a proposal to expand the ability of New Yorkers to make charitable contributions. As is well known, both of these proposals are intended to mitigate the impact of the severe restriction of the federal SALT, already highlighted in my testimony. We do not have any comments on the proposal at this time, as they are very complex and require much more analysis of both tax and non-tax related issues. We are committed to exploring these options with the state and the City Council to provide relief to taxpayers and also to ensure that there are no unintended consequences for the City's tax base. In closing, New York City has historically contributed more to the federal government than it has received. According to the State Controller, for federal fiscal year 2016, New York State provided $40.9 billion more in taxes to the federal government than it received back. For every dollar in federal taxes New York State sends to Washington, New York State gets back 84 cents. 
We are concerned the salt deduction limitation could worsen the gap. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have. Hey, thank you very much for your testimony, and uh, we do have numerous questions. Uh, let me just start off uh, by um, talking a little bit about the 30-day amendments to the 2018-19 uh, state budget legislation. And I think in your testimony you said you don't have much to comment on it at this point. I assume that's because of the complexity of that situation. That's true. We, we applaud the effort to try to address some of the issues to mitigate the federal tax impacts. But uh, as I'm sure you are aware and your staff are aware, they're very complex issues. So we're, we're in the process of studying and getting feedback from various stakeholders. Would you know at this point what the incentive would be for an employer to sign on to this option? Um, and since its deductibility merely reduces the extra tax but does not fully offset it. Well, in theory, I mean, this is the problem, is theory. We have to see how it's going to work out in practicality. Um, the theory is that the employer would be held harmless, that to the extent that there's a payroll tax, the wages that they pay their employees would be reduced, the employees would get a PIT credit to keep them whole, but they would be able to gain the federal deductibility. But I think part of the process now is to s talk this issue through with various stakeholders to see their perspective on the issue. So uh, would it be better to impose the tax on all businesses instead of it making it optional for them? Well, the, you know, these are policy discussions, but given how uh, brand new the concept would be and how kind of uh, such a major shift in policy, the opt-in uh, approach does have the advantage that you're, do, you're kind of incrementally implementing a major change in tax policy and you would give employers some discretion and, and to be honest we could learn from the process if it's done in an incremental fashion. Would you at this point ha have any idea about how many employers and what type of employers might choose to opt into this um, proposal? We don't at this time. That's partially why we want to get stake, uh, you know, um, responses from stakeholders from employer groups. Um, what might be some of the unintended consequences from such a proposal? From the uh, payroll tax proposal? Yeah. Well, I guess we're, we're still trying to figure out how or one of the you know, academics as well as policy people are trying to look at what would be the implication as far as um, how employers would gauge their wages. If wages go down, there could be non-tax impacts on payroll taxes that are for social insurance programs, uh, employee p pension programs are linked to wages. There's also issues with collective bargaining agreements. So again, part of the process is to vet this with stakeholders to get feedback on all the various non-tax as well as tax issues. What about municipalities? Uh, how would it work for municipalities? Um, I know that there probably are contractual um, issues with opting into that as well. Do you have any idea how that might work for municipalities? Well, that's another issue that has to be studied, how governments would flow through the benefit to their employees and, and some of the civil service rules and collective bargaining agreements are something that needs to be studied. But at this point, we think everything should be on the table to be studied. And I, I don't, you know, I am saying that we need to study it, but I think we endorse the idea of trying to be creative to come up with mechanisms to recoup some of the lost federal deductibility. So the 30-day amendment does not give the city uh, authority to set up its own employer compensation expense tax. Um, that would shift the burden of the city uh, personal income tax uh, onto businesses in the city. How would you um, envision seeing that happen in the city? Well, this is something that also, again, I keep saying we need to study, but the idea would be if you had a payroll tax in the city, uh, we would have to look at if the mechanism to the extent possible could be, I mean, there's tax administration concerns about having constructs at the state and city level that are coordinated, um, and then it would be somewhat a, a synonymous type of uh, structure that you would uh, provide a payroll tax. The em employer, in theory, would reduce the wages to the employees, so it still raises those issues about the impacts of reduced wages. Uh, and then there would be a local PIT credit and construct. But you know, part of this is kind of talking through with different interest groups how it would play out. Is the city now considering uh, something, a proposal similar to that? I think we're thinking everything's on the table. So we think it is worth looking at and studying and seeing if it's viable, but at this point we don't have a, you know, a policy decision to make. 
Would we need state uh, approval to do such a thing? We would need state approval. I think they've shown openness to uh, being creative at the local level as well as the state level. But yes, it would require uh, state approval. You know, before being chair of, the, of, the, of this committee, I was chair of the Education Committee. It's obviously a, an issue of major importance to me. I'm concerned how would dollars flow uh, if there was an educational charity fund set up? Have you any idea how that, that how it would affect the other end? Like how would the Department of Education, for example, receive funding? Well, the law does specify the mechanism of, you know, where the charities go into, what the funding would be for. Um, there, you know, there are still a lot of issues with understanding exactly how they would work. I mean, there is concern about IRS scrutiny of them. I think people are basing the idea of having local charitable funds on precedent in states that do have these type of funds. Um, but the idea would be people would be contributing into the designated funds which have specified um, services that they would fund. Is there any concern that um, contributions to those funds would not be used for the purposes for which they're intended? Is there a way that they would be able to shift the funding out of one area and into another as we move through the year? I think the funds have pretty specified purposes to which they could be used. Um, the 30-day amendment gives New York City and all the localities the option to set up their own funds to receive donations from homeowners to support education, as I was saying. The city would then give homeowners a 95% credit to reduce their property tax liabilities. Uh, in your view, what are some of the potential administrative challenges, if any, in establishing and operating such funds? Well, again, it is a, you know, the, even though some localities throughout the country have them, it is a new construct, so we'd want to fully understand all the implications, not only in setting up the funds and, as you said, making sure the, the receipts went to the proper place, but also, from the city's perspective, cash flow issues about how the money would come in. Um, you know, there, there has been discussion about if the city were interested in doing this kind of fund, whether or not it would be better to have a personal income tax credit at the local level, which tenants could benefit from. Um, not just a property owner credit. Um, and with all these proposals, the other thing we're very concerned with is making sure that the city's revenue base is protected, uh, that you know, contributions that lead to deductions that the city can recoup and have a revenue neutral basis for what's protect our citizens and be revenue neutral to the city. Uh, how long would it take to study this and, and get back to us on this? Well, we're hoping you're going to be our partners. We can study it together. I think the, the, over the next month, a lot of issues will be fleshed out as the state legislature. You know, the governor released his 30-day amendments two weeks ago. So it's going to be debated at the state level. Um, I think you know, through coordination with finance staff, we should discuss what we see as the pros and cons of the issues and get feedback from stakeholders. So it's not like a definitive timeline. These are major changes to the tax system. But I think a lot will happen in upcoming months, and part of it is having communication on the issues. Have you begun to look at any other jurisdictions and how they're dealing, it, dealing with it and implementing it? I'm sorry, say that again. Have you dealt with, have you begun to reach out to other jurisdictions uh, to see what other cities may be doing? We are of aware of what other jurisdictions are up to. We haven't had that many direct contact discussions, which may be worth doing. But I think the construct that the state has proposed is similar to what other states are thinking of. So regarding the charitable funds option that authorizes the city to create its own charitable funds and to provide a property tax credit equally 95% of any donation, in a report by the Division of Budget, the state expressed an openness to authorizing a tax credit against, the New, York City, against New York City's personal income tax. Would it be beneficial for the city to pursue this authorization? And have you had any conversations with the state on this matter as of now? I think, as you said, the state is open to flexibility, to what works best. And as I mentioned before, we do think, from a policy perspective, there are advantages as doing it a personal income tax credit from the fact that a lot of um, you know, city residents do not own property. So tenants would also be able to take advantage of any mechanism that's created. Um, in your testimony also, I noticed that you said that the um, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will cost $1.5 trillion over 10 years. Uh, just let me go back to the question I had in regard to that. Um, I think it was on page 9. Uh, you talked about the Supplemental Nutrition uh, Program, or SNAP program, food stamps. Um, what is the cost of that that they, has been proposed, the cuts to that over the 10 years? 
Gonna about 131 him. million? Well, I'm asking uh, uh, Francisco, billion? our own big person, to comment. <laughs> Uh, so there are two things that the uh, uh, federal budget uh, proposed. One, to decrease the amount of money that goes into SNAP, and then to substitute the, that amount of money with actual food delivered to families <coughs> that receive a, a benefit ab above a certain threshold. So, and that's part of the, of the proposal um, that, that the White House has put on the table. So do you have a number on that? <laughs> <laughs> Not with me, but I will come back to you. <laughs> um, it's a major concern to us and to the speaker as well. Obviously, one of the things that we want to do as we move forward through the negotiation process is to protect that social safety net, and that is one of the large ones. Um, I'm sure that that's probably a concern for the administration as well. So uh, we do look forward to further discussion on all of the, the issues that you raised on page 9. Um, community development, block grants, public housing, capital funds, et cetera. Uh, so, all right, so for me, that's about it. At this point, I want to announce that we've been joined by Council Member Adams and Cumbo, and there are questions from Council Member Powers. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. And uh, as, the, as the Council Member representing the President of the United States of America, I feel a certain amount of responsibility for, uh, for this, so ap apologies from the floor. Um, <laughs> I, the first question I had was uh, uh, total impact in FY19. I didn't see if you guys had an estimate on total cost to the city of New York this year. And understanding, I think some of these are for future years. If there's an estimate on impact for 19, 20, 21, and the years beyond that, like an a total number estimate. You know, we can get back to you with with the yep. estimates we do have. Sure. Any ballpark on. Well, we're giving you what we think is the annual full-year impact in the first year. I think a lot of the programs, you know, once they go into effect, which is a current tax year, uh, will have full impacts until provisions start to expire. So yeah. I think there will be growth in them, but I think we can, I think the ballpark we have in the uh, testimony is pretty much going to tell you what's going to be in out years. For the out years, okay. And um, uh, just on the tax, and you guys in our, in our report talks a bit about tax migration, uh, out of New York State, and uh, some evidence that there's some time, you know, the ta impacts on taxes can, in fact, lead to the migration of obviously New Yorkers to other places. Uh, obviously, understanding some of the things like deductions may be no matter where you live, what is their expected migration uh, out of New York City, New York State, based on changes to this, to, to, to the tax law that could have, would affect New York City relative to other areas, other cities or states? And if so, what is the expected, if any? Uh, migration. Right. I don't think there's really any solid empirical study. I think there's just general concern that when you have a change in uh, tax law that's been the same for 100 years, that you know you have the states and localities taxes can be deducted at the federal level on the margins, it creates you know a less favorable environment. I think most migration studies generally show you know tax increases in particular circumstances aren't driving forces. They can be marginal forces depending on the life situation of a household. Um, but I think there's just general concern that we're in kind of unknown territory because of the, how large the federal tax changes are. So it's a concern. And are there any specific parts of this tax bill that affect, would affect the New York? Like the SALT deduction affects you regardless of where you live, I think. Um, are there any parts of this that would affect uni a New Yorker uniquely versus somebody who lives in, oh, you know? I think it's really the, the, uh, the, as, we, as we deal with the balance of payment situation, it's really the disproportionate impact. I mean, a lot of the provisions that affect New York City are provisions that are nationwide, but it just disproportionately hits the city. Yeah, right. So it creates a, you know, more of a gap in our uh, you know, balance of payment with the federal government. Got it. And, and there were, um, no, I noted that, and I think it's in your testimony, there are, uh, or, or in one of the discussions about changes to the estate tax, I think doubling the estate tax. Have you guys done an estimate on how, how many New Yorkers pay the estate tax, New York City residents? It's very small. I mean, probably a few thousand. They tend yeah. to be very rich um, yeah. because the, the, you know, the exemption is already pretty high. So we do yeah. view that. When you look holistically at the uh, federal proposal, that's one main item that primarily flows to the wealthy. And do you have, I know, understood, and do you have numbers on how the change, what the number is after the change estimate? Oh, sorry, say uh, how many people would be paying it after? 
Ping, oh, yes, we, well, I think we basically, well, we have, a, well, we have here an estimate how, how much the revenues will reduce, but we can give you an estimate of that. I don't yeah. have it on Just fingers. curious. Great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, and isn't it true that about 1.5% of taxpayers pay about 43% of the taxes, personal income taxes, here in the city? That sounds familiar. Right, so <laughs> <laughs> the issue of flight or leaving the city, I think is one of major concern, just not even uh, in a district like uh, Councilmember Powers District, of course, where many of those folks do live, but to others as well because of the impact that it would have on the rest of the budget here. Uh, we also have questions now from uh, Councilmember Adams and Councilmember Gordenchik. Thank you very much for your testimony here today. We really do appreciate it. In your closing um, statement, it's just very, very um, disturbing to me to always see and hear about the number, the disparity um, of the contribution that New York City and state contributes to the federal gov government compared to what, it, what we show for it, what we get back. Um, I'm just curious to know that we've got um, New York State, New Jersey, and Connecticut involved in a lawsuit against the federal government. Are you taking a look at perhaps joining that suit as well? I think at this point all everything's on the table. I don't think a decision may not have been made yet, but we're looking for any creative solution that can tackle the federal problems. Are there any specific actions um, set up so far uh, for the administration to uh, further that effort? Well, as I mentioned, I know I keep using the word study, <laughs> but we are, we realize also that people want to act. So we're trying to study, and a lot of that is also just communication, that we want to hear your feedback, your staff feedback. And to be honest, with some of the proposals like payroll taxes, we want to hear what various stakeholders have to say. The employers find it a mechanism that they'll avail themselves of. Uh, the issue of the theory of in theory, it's a, it's a nice concept. You can get back the federal deducti deductibility through a backhanded way, right? You just basically do a payroll tax and lower wages, and lowering wages reduces your taxable income. On the other hand, lowering wages is, is uh, both emotionally and an empirical issue, uh, and it involves, as I mentioned, a lot of non-tax issues. So it's partially just getting feedback, communicating, and looking through and thinking about all the kind of pros and cons. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that this is going to be beneficial to employees, and we want to make sure that it's um, you know, administrable, that we can do it in a way that works effectively and protects our citizens. Okay, so it sounds like there's a lot of fact-finding and information gathering going on right now. Is there a timetable that you have set up um, to, get, to get your facts and information to, to gain a starting point for any of this? Well, you know, again, the, 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 with these order of magnitude changes, they, they aren't simple. We realize that people want to see, you know, some findings and steps. And the state, I think, did a first, good first step in this report it came out with. But I think the key thing now is working with your staff and working with other stakeholders to talk through the issues and, and in some sense, thinking about what are the toughest issues we need to tackle and where are areas that they, there's consensus that we may be able to move forward in certain, in certain provisions. Okay, thank you. Councilmember uh, Grudenczyk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. I I just have a quick question uh, for Commissioner Hyman. Um, I added up the numbers, uh, page three of your testimony. Um, you indicated 25% of city filers will receive no f personal uh, federal income tax cut, 10% will receive an increase, and 37% will receive a cut of less than $20 a week. So that adds up to 72%. What happened to the other 28% of New Yorkers? I'll have to get back to you. It could be there is a portion that receives greater than $20 a week. I mean, part of it, what we, maybe we need to get back with you is a more of a holistic perspective, because the personal income tax is only one part of the equation. When we look at the corporate tax cuts, the estate tax cuts, and the personal income tax cuts, how do we think this will flow through to New York City residents? There's maybe a perspective we can share with your staff and they can share with you. Well, I'd, I'd be curious, Mr. Chair, to find out, you know, the, what the 100% leads to. As for the the inheritance tax, I'll let my son worry about that, but uh, <laughs> I'm not planning on going anywhere yet, so I, I would appreciate knowing because uh, it is important for us to have all the information. Um, I think when most New Yorkers do think about how the new tax uh, law will affect us, they're thinking mostly about personal income tax, and I think for the vast majority of New Yorkers, uh, most New Yorkers will never file for an inheritance. They may have to file an estate, but um, 
they're not going to pay any of those taxes. No, that, that's a very good point. I just mean from the perspective on when you think about from income distribution, who benefits from the whole federal program. I mean, right, most people don't pay the estate tax, but that benefit from the federal government is going to the wealthy, whereas in the PIT, it's a mixed bag. There's no, some I, un I understand that, and that's, but I think most of our constituents, the vast majority, 90-something percent, 99-plus um, percent will never have to worry about the inheritance tax. But I do uh, realize the impact it has on New York, because that's maybe one of the good things about this. It'll, it'll bring, leave some more money in the city. But um, that's my question. I would appreciate it if, if somebody on your staff could get back to, hey, this is my time. Um, <laughs> somebody on your staff could get uh, back to Mr. Majewski, who uh, I can always find. So okay. thank you very much. Thank you. I didn't know you were planning on getting about, uh, what, 11.2 million in inheritance? Is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or leaving that amount of money? <laughs> uh, let me ask a couple of questions on affordable housing as well. The federal tax bill did not repeal the low-income housing tax credit, which encourages the investment of private equity in the development of affordable rentals for low-income households. However, reducing the corporate tax rate from 35 down to 21 percent will inherently reduce the value of the low-income housing tax credit. Can you talk about the city's current utilization of that credit and how the federal tax changes might affect its use by the city? Sure. Um, so the, the nationally, the low-income low housing tax credit is one of the main um, instruments for the development of um, affordable housing. And nationally, it's responsible for about 90,000 uh, units each year, and in the city in 2016, it was responsible <coughs> both types of the tax credit and the uh, um, tax exempt bonds that go with it um, for about 10,000 units um, in 2016. Uh, the impact of the of the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is indirect because the tax rate on corporate uh, has gone down. There is less tax liability, so there is less demand. Uh, you know the, the the analysis, the estimate uh, made in uh, 2016 before you know before the passage of the of the act was <clears throat> a potential impact of uh, 200 million in terms of the amount of equity raised uh, for the development um, of affordable housing. Now, of course, you know there was an estimate before the fact. Now we'll need to actually see what what the implications are uh, as we go along, as we go further in time. In the commissioner's testimony, though, he said something about 200 million yes, loss, 200 million. potential 200 yes. million loss yes. for that program. Mm -hmm. um, that was the estimate. And did you mention the number of affordable rental units that we could lose? Well, we, we, don't, we don't have that estimate. We have, we know, we have uh, the estimate that we did in 2016 about the potential impact on equity, we'll, uh, but we don't have the and actual impact on what we thought. What do we, we thought. have plans of how we're going to deal with that? Well, I think it's too early to tell um, right now. Um, you know, there are, there are a number of things. There is legislation in, in, the, um, uh, in the federal uh, legislature that, that would increase the housing tax credit. It's sponsored by the chairman of the Senate committee, uh, Orrin Hatch, which, which passed the tax, uh, the tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So uh, it's bipartisan. Uh, so that's one thing that, you know, if passed would, would uh, actually compensate, even more than compensate, the impact, uh, the potential impact of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, so, you know, all of these things are developing, and, and that's what we're uh, fighting for. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're good. Yes. Sorry. I, I just wanted to re-ask a question I asked at the beginning, which is, what is the estimated impact in the FY19 under this tax bill? I said the estimated impact on? On New York City's budget. New York City budget. Um, well, I think we have estimates here on the impact on city residents. As far as, do you mean the impact on Yeah, we programs? have an $88 billion budget the mayor proposed. We got be briefed on, and the question is, what are we expecting in lost revenue as by virtue of the tax bill in 19? Maybe 20 and 21 would be helpful too if those are, but let's we can do 19. I understand we're not in the. Right. So the, the, um, there, there are a number of implications of the tax bill that we've been talking about there and even at this hearing, you know, I've heard about, you know, the potential, uh, you know, the impact on high income earners and their mobility and, and the housing tax credit and so on and so forth. Um, the, the 
budget takes into account the macro macroeconomic impact of the of the tax cuts and jobs act uh, as, it, as it does state that meaning which what what's what's well, the, what the tax cuts and jobs act is uh, um, uh, is going to have a short term stimulating effect right, on the economy right. uh, so that's going to flow through also to yeah. the city right um, and that's that, that's the main way in which the the uh, the, the preliminary budget in its economic and tax forecast uh, takes into account the tax cuts and jobs act um, with that's you know that's uh, I, I don't have a specific number for you but it's uh, you know we have an increase in GDP of between 0.2 and 0.3 percentage points in the next couple of years so that that flows through in higher incomes and uh, and more economic activity so you think there's an initial impact that's positive based on I guess more money immediately, but is there? I guess I guess my my to state my question again is: I mean, we do have an eighty-eight point six, I think, billion dollar budget uh, that is uh, before us as a, for discussion in the city, and I'm I'm just wondering if we've if we are taking an account. I mean, I think the answer I know the answer is yes, so I'm not I'm not here to criticize, but I I guess my question is: what are we what are we anticipating in lost revenue this year, and do we have a number for next year in terms of money that won't be available to? I mean, because uh, I guess the point is social set, is social uh, safety net programs, affordable housing, obviously personal incomes, all, all these all these factors that we care and consider as as I know you do too. I guess we're I'm trying to determine. I think many are here to who are in the audience too. Is exactly immediately. What are we looking at in terms of uh, a hit to New York City? Uh, and that helps us, I think, explore other options and certainly support our colleagues who are going to Albany to advocate for uh, ways to be creative around uh, the implementation of it. Um, but is there not a number available in terms of what we might or a ballpark in terms of what we, we feel like the impact is today? We're very much working through those estimates as of now, so I don't have a number available okay. for you. When right? do you guys think you get to a point? I know, and I know part of this is related to the state budget, so April 1st, the state does or does not act on upon of these few items. Do so you, think, you do think it's after, after April 1st when you get oh, a sense of... Oh, I'm sorry. On, on some of these uh, items, we'll have a much clearer idea after the, after the state budget. Uh, as as uh, you, you may know, and it, I believe it's been mentioned, right? This this upsides from the flow through of the taxes to yeah. the city's uh, budget were not included in the in right. the forecast, right, right? Right, right? So there is no in, if the the coupling actually goes through, right? Uh, okay. That that we don't need to change our, our right, forecast, right, right, right. Okay, right? So, okay. So that's one. That's going to be one area of of clarity. <coughs> Uh, clearly, you know, we're studying all of the changes in the payroll tax, potentially, right? We are exploring the, the feasibility, so, you know, if those have uh, fiscal consequences, those will be included after after the um, state budget. The budget. Right. Okay. So we, is, 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 we can follow up maybe after April 1st to talk more about uh, impact numbers, so forth? Absolutely. We, I'm sure we will. Thanks. <laughs> And actually, we're going to start some of that on uh, March 5th with the budget hearings that are coming up. So we'll get, begin to get a general idea of what it, it looks like uh, at, after those hearings begin. Right. Well, we've been joined by Council Member Van Bremer. Thank you very much. And uh, seeing no other questions, I want to say thank you very much for coming. And uh, we will see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, up next is Preston, Preston Nieblack from the Controller's Office.
Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Okay, thank you. Preston, would you like to start? Thank you, Chair Drum, members of the committee. Um, I'm Preston Niblack, Deputy New York City Controller for Budget, testifying today on behalf of City Controller Scott Stringer. Uh, I'm joined today by our Director of Revenue Estimation, Steve Giacchetti, and our Chief Economist, Larry Maliki. The Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act represents the biggest change in both personal and corporate federal income taxation in a generation since the Tax Reform Act of 1986. It could not, however, be more different in spirit and effect from that overall. The TCGA represents partisan policymaking at its most petty. The ways in which it appears to deliberately target higher tax jurisdictions such as ours is unprecedented. In the long run, it profoundly undermines our city's ability to continue to provide a robust social safety net by eroding our economic competitiveness and revenues. So there's a tremendous amount one could discuss today, so in the interest of uh, relative brevity, at least. I'm going to focus on three broad topics. Uh, the impacts on New York City individual taxpayers, the impacts on the broader city economy, and then the interaction between the new tax law and our state and city tax codes. Um, and I'll conclude with a note of caution about many of the unknowns and uncertainties that have been raised by such a massive, massive yet hasty overhaul of the tax code. The controller's analysis shows that nearly 475,000 largely middle-class New York City federal taxpayers would face higher tax liabilities under the TCGA. The capping of the state and local tax deduction at $10,000 and the elimination of certain other deductions is the most common reason. We estimate that roughly half of taxpayers earning between $100,000 and $500,000 in income are likely to face higher tax bills. At the highest end of the income spectrum, above a million dollars in our analysis, the picture is more complex and depends on various factors, uh, including primarily source of income. New York City has an unusually large proportion of high income taxpayers whose income is largely derived from wages and bonuses as opposed to business income, which as you know is treated more favorably under the law. The cap on the SALT deduction obviously tends to raise their tax bills. Perhaps surprisingly, nearly 58% of such taxpayers could actually see increases. Those millionaires who will get tax cuts will get big ones, $337,000 on average, according to our analysis. They are primarily filers with pass-through business income, which is eligible for a 20% deduction up to a cap against a filer's personal income taxes. Mere wage earners, of course, don't get this deduction and will thus be taxed at a higher rate on the same income, violating a basic tenet of tax equity. In addition to these distributional impacts, the tax bill raises a number of concerns for the long-term economic competitiveness for, of high-tax jurisdictions like ours. First, because of the cap on SALT deductions, the difference in top marginal tax rates between high-tax and low-tax states has widened. The ability to deduct state and local taxes on your federal return prior to this year meant that your effective state and local tax rate was lower than your nominal rate. That's now no longer the case with state and local tax rates effectively a third higher than they were. The focus on this issue has often been on the very rich, perhaps for the obvious reasons that they both account for a disproportionate share of taxes paid, as you noted, and because they are perceived as more easily able to change their tax domicile than middle class working households. But it is not just a matter of departing millionaires. As I've noted, this also impacts plenty of middle class filers. Being able to attract and retain the middle class is important to the city's long run economic and fiscal health as well as our social fabric. The federal tax law undermines our ability to do so. Additionally, the loss of SALT deductibility also means that many more taxpayers will likely choose the expanded standard deduction rather than itemizing which also has implications for charitable giving, for example. Many middle-income households may be affected by this, and while they are no doubt most often motivated by other concerns than just their tax liability, it nonetheless eliminates an incentive for charitable giving that could potentially impact the fundraising of many nonprofit social services agencies and other organizations, which are, of course, a critical part of our city's social services network. Even the treatment of pass-through business income disfavors New York, because not all business income is treated the same under the law. While the bill provides benefits to real estate partnerships, go figure, many professional services partnerships that are an important part of our economy, like accountants, lawyers, and doctors, won't be eligible for this deduction. 
The changes in federal tax law, of course, also impact state and city income taxes, which take federal adjusted gross income and federal deductions as their starting points. And this raises the question of decoupling, that is, should we adjust our own tax codes so we're not as closely and automatically tied to the federal code? Controller Stringer testified about the need to decouple at the local government hearing in Albany last month. Our analysis indicates that the combined impact on state and city personal income tax liabilities for New York City residents would be nearly $800 million without decoupling. Governor Cuomo, as was noted, included legislative proposals to mitigate the impacts of the federal tax bill in his 30-day budget amendments. These included an optional payroll tax and charitable contributions for certain public uh, functions and decoupling certain aspects of the state PIT from the new federal law. Notably, the governor included the decoupling of state and local tax deductions from the federal caps and eliminating the requirement to use the standard de deduction on the state return if you do so on your federal return. The governor has also proposed amending state law to remove a provision that would have lowered the standard state deduction for single filers, which would cost single taxpayers $840 million on their state and city returns unless fixed. As a single taxpayer, I take particular exception to this. Thanks. The legislature will need to make similar changes at the city level as well, which the mayor's preliminary budget assumes will happen. Without these changes, city taxpayers will face an increased local tax bill some $365 million by our estimate. I'll conclude with some observations on corporate tax changes and on the tremendous uncertainties such a huge change in the tax code raises for the future. On the corporate side, there are a very large number of unresolved implementation and legal issues and unknowns. The changes to corporate taxes and the treatment of foreign income are some of the most complex features of the plan. Implementation issues are typical of any tax reform but are compounded by the fact that this act was passed hastily in a matter of months rather than the years it took to pass the 1986 reform. Technical guidance from the IRS and even amendments to the law will be needed on many provisions of the act. One thing that seems clear, however, is that in the short run at least, Many companies are using their corporate tax savings for one-time bonuses, stock buybacks, and shareholder dividend payouts, rather than on raising base pay for their workers, whose wages have been stagnant during most of the current economic expansion, or making capital investments. This was an entirely predictable outcome of enacting tax cuts at a time when corporations are sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars in cash without passing any of it along to their workers in the form of higher pay. And finally, we still don't know how many or what kinds of behavioral responses could be triggered by the TCGA and how those play out could have a large impact on city tax revenues. To take just two examples, it remains unclear how the impact of repatriated profits will affect capital gains realizations and dividends. And the differential in tax rates between pass-through entities and C-Corps could cause some existing partnerships to restructure as C-Corps. New York City, this could be even more pronounced given the double taxation of pass-through income at both the entity level with the UBT and that of the individual taxpayer. There are plenty of reports of such restructurings already, and due to the lower corporate rate, such restructurings could ult ultimately result in lower revenues at all levels of government, including New York City because of its unincorporated business tax. That was perhaps the intent all along. Because the worsening of the federal deficit as a result of the tax bill is not sustainable in the long run, it is clear that cuts to social services, education, health care, and other programs that provide critical services to many New Yorkers are next up on the agenda in Washington. In sum, while we do know many of the impacts of the TCGA with a good degree of certainty for all the reasons outlined above, we will not know the full extent for many years to come but there are already many reasons to be concerned about how the tax bill will ultimately affect our economy, our revenues, and our residents. Thank you, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate your testimony. So the Joint Commission on Taxation estimates that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will add a trillion dollars to the federal deficit over the next 10 years. Are there any particular programs that you are concerned about that are most at risk? So uh, I, I feel slightly less anxious <laughs> than I did this time last year, I think, about federal tax cuts because of the two-year budget agreement that was reached. Um, and the president's budget in some ways was so outrageous that it was hard to take seriously even in the absence of that agreement. Um, 
it seems less threatening now that there is a budget agreement in place. Um, we've, you know, outlined where we get about seven billion dollars a year worth of baseline federal aid, and it, you know, it's not much in the overall picture, but it's very important in particular areas, uh, and you know, child welfare services, homeless shelters, uh, housing, uh, especially co housing code maintenance, et cetera, a whole slew of areas that, uh, if there were cuts. Uh, would blow holes in our budget. And then there are the areas where if there were cuts, the city would be under a lot of pressure, I think, to pick up the difference. So, you know, if there were cuts to NYCHA's operating or capital, uh, if there were cuts to SNAP, you know, I'm sure that there would be uh, a lot of concern that somebody else pick up the slack. The federal tax code has many flow-through effects on city and state taxes, and the state is proposing to decouple from a number of federal tax changes, the limit on state and local tax deductions being only one of them. Are there any federal tax changes under the tax, under the TCJA deductions, adjustments, or other provisions that you believe are beneficial to the city and should be maintained? Hey, this is, you know, it's, right. the, the one, decoupling provision that Governor Cuomo included in his original budget was uh, decoupling from the child care tax credit, which child care credit, which um, uh, effectively doubled under the new law. And that was significantly costly to the state. Uh, we don't uh, have, we don't have a flow down. We don't have that here at the local level, so it doesn't affect us so much um, uh, in terms of our budget. But it might be part of the mix in the decoupling discussion and the discussion of sort of how the state responds to the uh, federal tax bill. Thank you. So New York City taxes pass through entities such as partnerships and S corporations through the unincorporated business and general corporation taxes, which remain fully deductible. The city provides owners of these entities credits on their personal income tax to offset the business taxes that they pay. Are there any options you think the city should consider, such as increasing these taxes and offsetting them with credits as an option for reducing uh, the uh, effects of the SALT deduction on owners of city businesses? So there's, if we were to uh, decouple uh, as the mayor has assumed and as the governor has begun to propose, um, then I think we, we're going to have to walk through sort of the whole tax structure of how people uh, source their income and pay their taxes. There's obviously an incentive to uh, find a way to make your income business income so that you could get the 20% deduction. And if it's a partnership, you know, with enough members to form a, a board, a corporate board, you know, you might want to even go and incorporate as a C corp because then you're taxed at 21%. Boom. So I, you know, the, the sort of, as I noted at the end, you know, the behavioral changes that could result from all this are going to take a little while to shake out, and I, you know, it's hard therefore to sort of get ahead of that without doing something unintended. I think nonetheless all of these things have to be considered, but it's a little bit of an intellectual exercise at the moment, uh, you know, that's causing Steve to stay up late a lot, uh, uh, to try and sort through even the existing provisions and how they interact with each other. So. Until we see what it, what it all exactly means. Uh, Council Member Powers. Yep. Thank you. Um, two questions, one on, on two parts of your testimony, one on impact. First being um, uh, the charitable contribution uh, effect, which we hear actually sometimes on the other side when we talk about raising taxes on, on high earners, which is the impact on, on charitable giving and, and, uh, and social services and things like that. Is there any evidence so far to believe that we're seeing, I mean, it's too early to see it on this, but is there any reason to believe that there will have a, a real impact on charitable giving to organizations in the city? Right. There's not, you know, so there's, sort of, there's two groups of people who give uh, charitable donations, high income and low income. Middle income taxpayers actually don't give that much of their income. 
Um, Low-income people tend to give it to uh, uh, local social services organizations and churches. You know, high-income people, not to be a caricature, you know, buy buildings with their names on them. So in some ways, those are all motivated by reasons that have nothing to do with your tax liability, right? So the, there's a real open question that has, there's no real empirical evidence on about how it would be, uh, what the impact would be. It does concern me that there's a group of people who are particularly disfavored in the city under this tax law, who probably do a fair amount of charitable giving, but who will now opt to go with the uh, standard deduction and thus, you know, sort of lose that uh, charitable giving itemization. Steve, you want to? And then the other consideration is the raising of the estate tax threshold. Right. So you would also lose your, the incentive to deduct on that additional six million dollars from five to 11 million. So that exemption would also lower the incentive for, for very rich individuals to make charitable deductions. Again, it's, it's the incentive. If they donate for other purposes, they would still donate. I, you know, every social services or museum or any nonprofit organization that I talk to these days, I ask about this, and I think everybody's also still trying to figure out, you know, and some people saw a big rush at the end of this year, uh, you know, they're wondering about what does that mean for next year, and then in the longer run, I think it just is a little unclear still. So I'm so you say saw a rush this year because of so potentially a, a fear of the, okay, okay. Got it. Second thing is on the the companies using the corporate tax savings savings for one time bonuses or or um, not increasing wages, but for other other uh, you think you guys say stock buybacks, one time bonuses, dividend payouts. Any anything you guys can tell us anecdotally about that happening and what we might expect on that? Because uh, uh, I think it's I think it is you know concerning. If the money's not going, you know, and, and not unexpected, but any yeah. any other examples of that? I mean, I'll just, I'll just, as preface, say that, you know, the two, companies have been very profitable for a long time now, right? And they have not, you know, and then the lagging growth of productivity investments has really been a concern. So there's lots of cash sitting out there. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world that some of that cash will get repatriated and can be used for investments in here. But in the time being, you know, people are not, you know, especially at a time when the labor market is very tight and you would start to expect to see wages going up. It's just we're not seeing it yet. Um, so I, you know, there are lots of, you know, big companies that have given $1,000 bonuses. There are some that have begun to raise their minimum wage, I think, which is separate from the tax code. I think it's just the $15 minimum wage movement. Uh, there's lots of stock buybacks, you know, going on and people increasing their shareholder. You're not really seeing a whole lot of people who are just generally raising their wage levels at this point. Without, without or feeling mandated. Right, by, exactly, or feeling right. pressured. To so. cool. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you. Councilmember Drum, good to see you. Um, have you guys done an estimate for the net not bottom line impact on the city's budget revenues? Uh, no. Up and down? <laughs> Short answer, no. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it is very complicated and at the moment, I think the big question will be uh, what we, where we end up as far as decoupling goes. Without decoupling, taxpayer, we'd actually get an infusion of money into the budget of about $365 million yeah. by our estimate. You know, uh, I don't. Then you would also be losing on the side of from businesses. I mean, it. Not yeah, it, and it's just we're you know, we're still working through all of this and trying to understand it. And I don't know that we have a solid enough handle on all of these dynamics of this yet to really be able to. I think it would be interesting to be able to do um, an analysis um, where would you. Be. Um, looked at different scenarios of what the state could do to help New Yorkers and what the impact would be on the bottom line of the city's budget. I think it would be helpful. Steve will get right on that. <laughs> Nothing else to do. Right. I mean, I, when did you want that tomorrow? <laughs> TikTok. No, I think it would be really helpful. Um, 
for everyone. I don't, yeah. I don't know how you can sort of operate without it, but that's another story. Well, that's part of the challenge here. We're really in unknown territory and sort of getting, getting our bearings, as it were, is uh, a challenge. And so, you know, it is difficult to make policy in the absence of any sort of clear sense of where you're going to end up with no change. And I think that's a little bit of the problem right now for everybody. Um, is there any data that you're missing in order to do the analysis, something that the Department of Finance could be, I mean, I just think that you could model this out in a fairly straightforward way, but I'm not an economist. Funny you should ask. So we have good, we have pretty good uh, data on personal and individual income oh. tax data. Um, it's not, you know, there's not enough detail to get super into the weeds about stuff, but it's enough to be able to do kind of distributional impacts and to look at what we think might be the impacts on the city's uh, side. Uh, on the corporation side, uh, we've been going back and forth with the Department of Finance. Um, they have confidentiality concerns about that data. I think we've you know, tried to say that we would be more than happy to sign whatever they need in blood. Uh, we haven't gotten an agreement yet. So let's flip it to the administration. Does, the, does OMB have enough information to model that out? I, I think that they have enough information to be able to do reasonable uh, estimates, yes. I mean, give, you know, given the uncertainties, yes. Well, but that's why it's modeled, so. Okay, uh, I think that'd be incredibly helpful. I don't know if anyone from the administration is still here, but thank you for that. Thank you. Councilmember Powers. Yes, yeah, sorry. And just Picking up where, where Councilman Rosendahl left off, uh, what was the, you said something, a number, uh, was it $365 million? If we didn't decouple, that would be added to the city budget right. uh, because people would be paying more money. Is that essentially what it is? Yes. Um, uh, th okay, so thank you. S second, um, are, are, based on what you just said about not having the information, but DOF having the information, are you then surprised that they're here not able to tell us what expected revenue or loss of revenue uh, is expected to New York City. I mean, you just gave a number that seemed to be at ease and, and, uh, and obviously an estimate, but are you surprised that they're not able to give us uh, a projection of impact on the city budget? I think they, they gave did a number. give you a number and relating similar. to that specific number. They came up, I think, with 300. 330. Oh, 320. oh, oh right, right, right. They right. have 320. This is with regards to individual income taxes, right. where we're completely in the dark is on the corporate, the corporate. side. And they have that they, data, but are... They, they have both the corporate and the UB, and also they, they're able to model the pass-through aspect because they have UB information. They can model that much better than we can on, on the individual side. Correct. It's never... Of course. Well, thank you. So I think what would be helpful if we could ask, I don't know if you guys do this, um, or if the city council can just ask the administration to do that, and then model out what the impact of, you know, governor, what the state could do, and what impact that would have as well. I think that the um, reason we would, we would want to know that is so we could have that information as we think about uh, any changes to property taxes, which is the only thing that we have to play with, obviously. And, um, you know, sort of way, I, what I would, what I personally would not want to see happen is for the city, as is city's bottom line revenues to benefit from this and it's revenue based to grow, and therefore we fill that in with expenses. My inclination, this is just me personally, uh, would be to give that back to our citizens in the form of a property tax rebate of some sort. So we'd want to know the range of what we're dealing with. But I think that what the mayor is assuming in the preliminary budget is that. Uh, we will decouple so that there would not be that little windfall uh, from the personal income tax. Um, you know, at some point, obviously, as you noted, the legislature has to act, 
in order to decouple the city's uh, tax code from the federal tax code. And that, I would assume, is going to require a concrete proposal sooner rather than later that I would certainly hope they were discussing with the council. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's it for this panel. Thank you again. Thank you. Next, we're asking George um, Sweeting to come up uh, from the Independent Budget Office, please. I'm going to ask our council to swear you in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Drum and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'm George Sweeting, Deputy Director of the Independent Budget Office, and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify before you today. Um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, will affect most New York City taxpayers in diverse ways, some positive and some negative. It also brings significant economic and fiscal risks for New York City and New York State. Some of these problems are readily addressed by straightforward changes to the personal and business income tax laws of the city and state. Others could require more significant changes to our tax system that could benefit from careful vetting and analysis before proceeding, particularly because many of the taxpayers who are negatively affected are benefiting from other provisions of the Act. The single largest federal tax cut in the Act accrues to businesses thanks to the sharp reduction in the federal rate from 35 percent to 21 percent. That change has no direct effect on state and local business taxes, but other changes will, particularly the treatment of foreign income earned by U.S. businesses. The Governor's 30-day amendments to the executive budget legislation addresses one consequence of the business tax changes, the deduction for repatriated foreign dividends for state tax purposes. The city may also need to address business tax changes at the city level and considering its own uh, decoupling. I'll skip over the uh, uh, points on what the, uh, the act does on the business, uh, on the personal side, we've had a lot of discussion about them. It's the deduction changes that have understandably drawn the most attention. The governor's 30-day amendments propose changes to the state and city standard deductions in order to sidestep what would otherwise have been a large windfall, uh, excuse me, would, which would have otherwise have been large city and state tax increases for many taxpayers. Enacting these changes means foregoing tax windfalls for the city and state budgets, and it seems likely that they will be adopted. Deductibility of state and local taxes, or SALT, has been part of the structure of the federal income tax system since its inception over 100 years ago, based on the premise that income should not be taxed twice. However, the deduction also has the effect of shifting the federal tax burden from states with high taxes, which tend to have taxpayers with higher incomes, to states with lower taxes, which tend to have taxpayers with lower incomes. Although regressive, SALT deductibility is also deeply embedded in our country's structure of fiscal federalism, and it is not easily altered without compensating adjustments elsewhere. Unfortunately, the TJ, TCGA offers little evidence of concern for the many states and localities that will be profoundly affected by this shift. Capping SALT deductions at $10,000 poses long-term threats to the city and state economies, and will ha also have immediate consequences for many city taxpayers. But the number of taxpayers affected may be less than frequently discussed. Virtually all city taxpayers with adjusted gross income below about $75,000, who account for two-thirds of all city taxpayers, and one-half of city taxpayers claiming a SALT deduction, will get a tax cut, at least until 2016, thanks to the, lower standard, uh, to the larger standard deduction and lower rates. For those with AGI between 
75,000 and about 125,000, the average SALT deductions were about $12,000. Most of these taxpayers, too, will come out ahead thanks to the larger standard deduction and lower rates. Among taxpayers with AGI between 125,000 and about 500,000, the story is somewhat different. Many, if not most, have already lost their SALT deduction because they, were, they had become subject to the federal alternative minimum tax. Thus, there's no change due to the TG, TCGA. But because the burden of the AMT then begins to fall for households as you move above $500,000 in income, those taxpayers will see a, a, an increase as a result of, of the loss of SALT. It's, it's only about 56,000 taxpayers but they pay two points, those, that's 2.6% of all city taxpayers, but they account for 53% of city income tax revenue. And while this change will increase their federal taxes, it's important to remember that other changes in the, in the act, such as the 20% deduction for pass-through income, the corporate rate reduction, and higher thresholds for the AMT, all of which disproportionately benefit households in this income range, would, should result in offsetting some or all of the loss of the SALT deduction. Our office is working to develop a more comprehensive estimate of these changes. The governor's 30-day amendments include two proposals for limiting the effect of the SALT change for the federal tax liability of New York residents. One would create trust to receive donations from state and local taxpayers of payments for various public purposes. Taxpayers would then receive a new state tax credit equal to 85% of the donations made to such trusts. Because charitable, deductions, charitable contributions remain deductible for federal tax purposes, taxpayers would re regain much of the benefit they had previously received through the SALT deduction. It remains to be seen whether the Internal Revenue Service would be willing to treat such do donations as legitimate charitable donations. The second proposal by the governor would create a new optional employer payroll tax in the state. The tax would be 5% on the wages of employees who earn over $40,000. And the employees would then receive a credit for the tax paid by their employers to be used against their state personal income tax. Because payroll taxes remain deductible for federal business taxes, employers, in theory at least, would be held harmless. There are several potential complications that could undermine how well such a system works, not to mention the question of whether the federal government would allow it to stand. Let me conclude with some observations about the broader effects of these changes. First, while some economic forecasters have raised their forecasts for economic growth somewhat for the next few quarters, few outside of the Trump administration are projecting a major long-term boost to growth attributable to the act. With the economy near full employment, there is little reason to expect that the tax cuts can stimulate much new growth, particularly with the tax cuts tilted towards high-income households who have a greater propensity to save than households with lower incomes. And despite headlines about firms paying bonuses and hiking wages, more careful analysis suggests that so far, more of the sa tax savings are going into stock buybacks and dividends. Second. Although the act has officially cost the federal government 1.5, and I apologize, it says billion, it should say trillion, I'm used to the city budget, not the federal budget. Uh, the true cost is more likely to be 2.5 trillion, assuming that the personal income tax changes are not allowed to expire as scheduled after 2026. Most of this cost will be borrowed, thereby adding to the national debt and prompting alarmed calls from congressional leaders about the need to cut spending. Proposed targets include Medicaid, food stamps, and other safety net programs that primarily benefit lower income households, the households that receive the smallest benefits under the, job of the tax act. The Nonpartisan Tax Policy Center in Washington has analyzed the distributional effects of some possi possible spending reduction plans and found that when combined with the effects of the act, and the potential savings of reductions, the potential and potential savings reductions, the impact ranges from regressive to extremely regressive. If such federal federal spending reductions are enacted, demands to replace the federal dollars would present very difficult choices for both New York City and the state. 
So thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much uh, for coming and giving some testimony. As, ha as has been mentioned throughout the hearing, the Tax Cuts and Job Act severely limits the state and local tax deduction, and it also reduces the mortgage interest deduction and eliminates the deduction on home equity loans. All three deductions encourage home ownership by making it more affordable. Because of these tax changes, Moody's Analytics forecasts a 10 percent drop in Manhattan home values. In your opinion, to what extent are housing values likely to suffer due to these three tax changes? Uh, I, 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 would, I, I would agree that um, it's likely that there will be lower uh, property values as a result of this, whether it's the 10 percent number for Manhattan. And Manhattan is a, you know, that's a pretty small slice of the residential market in New York City. Um, so whatever, whatever effects are in Manhattan, it's more likely to be lower uh, as you move away from Manhattan. Um, but certainly, you know, capping the, the uh, uh, interest deduction, we looked at um, recent sales transactions over the last two years, and they're probably somewhere in the order of about nine to 9,500 9,000 to 9,500 sales that occur each year that are now going to be subject to the cap. Uh, the cap, the, the cap used to be one million dollars, and it was lower. It's been lowered to 70, 750,000. Our estimate is that there's about nine, 9,500 um, uh, sales in that in that new gap that are also going to be subject, and th that will put downward pressure on on prices. Um, I think well, I think in in many ways the 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 biggest effect will be the uh, the the fact that more people are going to be using the standard deduction rather than the itemized deduction. Once you go to the standard deduction, you're losing the um, you know the what, whatever you would get you would have gotten from the uh, the itemized mortgage interest deduction. Um, so yes, there you know I, I think it's there 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 will be effects there. It's worth remembering as we you know, talk about this, that if you're lowering prices, you're actually increasing affordability at the lower end. And so that there will be households that previously could not afford to buy will now, uh, if prices adjust, um, you know, uh, by, by a you know, relatively large amount, uh, you, you could actually bring more people into the housing, into home ownership than you previously had. So it's important, you know, that doesn't mean that it's not a problem, but it's also, um, you know, there are some benefits from this. Uh, <clears throat> while the state has already identified some federal corporate provisions to decouple from, are there any federal corporate provisions that would be advantageous for the city to decouple from? And if so, what are they? Well, I think one of the, you know, in the, the, the interaction between the, the federal law and the city law is, it's not quite as tight as with the uh, personal income tax, but there, there certainly are pieces that flow through into our tax base. It looks, uh, you know, I'm not a tax lawyer, but my reading of the, um, the, the, the current city code suggests that the, the treatment of the deduction that firms get against their um, repatriated income and this is, this is something the governor is addressing for state purposes. I believe that it, it's my, my sense that, that that's also an issue for the city tax. And so I think that's one issue that the city is going to want, you know, and, and we did not, the, the governor did not include the city in his 30-day amendment dealing with that issue. And so that might be something that um, I think the city, the city does need to take a look at. And there are probably some other, uh, you know, the, the governor has not proposed any other uh, uh, corporate changes, but there, there may very well be some corporate changes that the, the city has to take an independent look. On the, income, on the personal income tax, the city and the state have to move pretty much in lockstep on things like deductions and the basic definition of income, because it, it, it's just too complicated to have two different systems 
you know, since the state administers the income, the personal income tax for us, we have greater differences between the business, on the business side, between the city and the state. And so whatever the state's doing, you know, there's no guarantee that that works to our benefit without us also taking a, our own positive steps to, to make some changes. So I, I think there's a, there are probably a number of things the, the city needs to, to carefully consider on the uh, business side. Yep. Council Member Powers. Yes, quick. Thank you for the testimony. Um, one quick question. On the federal tax, you had a, 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 just a quick thing in there I want to just ask about, which is the question of whether the federal government will allow a, uh, anything the governor is going to do around reconfiguring the state uh, and uh, thereby the city tax system or charitable contributions. What are the threats? Is it, is it well, define that for me. Okay. I think on the, on the charitable contributions, um, the issue is you're, if you're making a charitable contribution and then getting a tax deduction for it, it's supposed to be something that doesn't directly benefit you. And so there's at least a, a threshold question, I think, that will have to be, you know, the IRS will have to consider, does this, um, you know, if, if you're making this charitable contribution really to pay your taxes, aren't you really getting a benefit? And therefore, does it qualify for the charitable deduction? On the other hand, uh, you know, the, the people who, who came up with this suggestion, um, it's grounded in uh, structures that the IRS has accepted in states where there are education trusts. And you can make a contribution to the education trust and you will get, that's been accepted as a, as a, um, a charitable deduction, at least in, in many states. So it may be that there's something to build on there. But I think on either the charitable deduction front or the payroll um, tax cut, uh, tax um, workaround. I think the other question, you know, there was real hostility by the federal government against places like New York City when they wrote this bill. And I think, you know, there's, there's, there's at least reason to be concerned that they could come back and write another, you know, write a change to the, to the, the basic tax, tax code that, said, that explicitly says, if you're using this to pay your general taxes, we're not going to accept it. Or, and even a payroll tax, you know, it's well established that payroll taxes are dedu deductible, but I'm not, you know, this is a payroll tax that's not going for unemployment insurance, not going for Social Security or Medicaid, uh, the, the, the more typical things that payroll taxes are going for. You know, there's a, there's a, a reasonable chance that the, the people who wrote this bill, knowing what, and they knew what they were doing, won't come back and say, you know what, we're going to change the law and payroll taxes can't, you, you don't have deductibility of payroll taxes if they're just the general government tax. Thank you. A, a concern to be aware of. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, we're going to call our next witness. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. I'd like to call Catherine Weil from the Partnership for New York City. James Parrott for the Center for New York City Affairs, Howard Chernick from uh, our Professor Emeritus from Hunter College, and Rachel Bird from the Public uh, Utility Law Project of New York. Mr. Parrott, would you like to begin?
effects. Uh, it is clear that it provides the over overwhelming bulk of tax reduction to the wealthiest 5%, mainly as a result of the limit on deductibility of state and local taxes, approximately one in eight New Yorkers will pay more federal tax in 2019, with the incidence of that highly concentrated in the upper middle income range. Taxpayers in the top 5% who have average incomes of, of nearly $1 million on net, their average tax cut will be about $17,000, 43 times the average $390 reduction going to those in the bottom 60% of the income distribution who have average incomes of around $33,000. I've attached uh, figure one, which has more detail on that. This extremely top-heavy tax cut comes in the context of the pronounced income polarization of recent years and against a backdrop of regressive overall New York state and local tax structure and a highly re regressive New York City local tax structure. And figures two and three at the, attached to my testimony show this regressivity of their overall state and local tax structure. I think it's important to point out, a lot of people are used to referring to the fact that uh, a very small percent of very high income New York, New York City residents pay uh, a very large share of the city income tax. That's true, but when you look at all of the taxes that households directly bear in New York City, the residential tax, the sales tax and the New York City income tax, we have a very highly regressive income tax structure, so we should keep that in mind. Um, there's no clear-cut answer to the question what the overall economic impact is of the tax bill, so I could say more about that. Um, the, uh, there is very, you know, there's a lot of concern that uh, this federal tax bill uh, was explicitly intended, among other things, to harm states like New York and California that have long and deeply rooted traditions of caring for the poor, providing expansive public services, and better health care access. Uh, as others had said, this limit on state and local deductibility goes against a century-old tenet of fiscal federalism. Most public services and infrastructure investments are provided in this country by state and local governments. This tax bill comes down squarely on the side of a heavy-handed federal government discouraging states and localities from serving the needs of their citizens and making needed investments in our economic infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> we, others have talked about the impact on New York City taxes, and it's too early to, to, to tell exactly how that's going to work out. Um, we're assuming that the state will decouple from the deductibility provisions uh, uh, at the federal level to sort of maintain the deductibility on the state and local uh, tax side. Um, so that will moderate any net Im impact on New York uh, City in the short term. Um, I also want to underscore the potential impact on services in New York City if the uh, dramatically higher federal deficit resulting from the tax bill uh, is another argument to steeply cut uh, federal aid. Um, and to the extent that there are harmful federal budget cuts affecting New Yorkers, the state and the city should consider a targeted federal tax cut windfall recapture tax to provide additional state and city revenues to offset some of the federal cuts. That would be targeted to the people who receive the bulk of the windfall uh, in the federal tax cuts. Keep in mind that overall in New York State, a net, there will be a net tax reduction of $15 billion, and about half of that will be received by the top 5%, and a lot of that is through the reduction in the corporate taxes and the reduction in taxes uh, related to pass-through business uh, income. I, too, am very skeptical about some of the work, workarounds that the governor's proposed. Uh, I think they're well-intended. It's laudable. Uh, it would be nice if New York State and city could do something to push back against uh, the, the disadvantaged treatment of New York and the federal tax law. However, these are very complicated um, uh, approaches, uh, and if it's subject to opt-in by corporations, I'm not sure that there are going to be a lot of companies that are they're eager to embark on that. Keep in mind that these workarounds are uh, intended 
to uh, offset the, the, the increased taxes that upper middle income people generally will pay as a result of the limits on deductibility. People in this income range have benefited from state tax reductions in recent years uh, in New York. I'm thinking of the uh, state budgets passed for fiscal 2012 and fiscal 2017, which reduced the state personal income tax burden on people uh, in this range. I'd like to close by, by underscoring what, what I think is the most important tax reform priority for New York City. And, and again, I, I call your attention to my figure three, which shows the overall regressivity of the city's tax structure. A lot of that regress, regressivity is a result of the property tax and the way that it uh, you know, imposes a very much higher effective property tax rate on, on rental properties um, and is very uh, unevenly uh, distributed in terms of its uh, economic impact uh, uh, across the city. Property tax reform is the number one, should be the number one priority for New York City, but you could only seriously uh, embark upon uh, a, a, a comprehensive property tax reform if Albany said we're going to defer to New York City on this, step back, not impose our own will on this, let New York City leaders appointed by the mayor and the city council, you know, uh, undertake the very politically challenging trade-offs that are necessary to do that. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that and I expect there'll be further consideration along those lines. I would like to see that come to pass, but again, it could only happen if Albany uh, stays out of the way. Thank you. Thank you, and let's just go across the panel and then we'll have questions. Uh, Ms. Wild. Thanks, I'm Kathy Wild, President and CEO of the Partnership for New York City, and delighted to be here with um, uh, Chairman Drum and the uh, Finance Committee today focused on uh, revenues for a change. Um, I won't repeat either a lot of what was, uh, a lot of the statistics that have been covered, but I do have a very different take on the situation than uh, than is generally described with, uh, I think James has conflated the corporate tax and individual tax treatment. And I, I just want to clarify that for the committee because I think it's important in terms of your policy deliberations going forward to keep that straight. So the corporate tax changes, the tax reductions and the repatriation at a lower tax rate will end up being good for the New York City economy because it will make our companies more globally competitive uh, on a tax basis. It brings our taxes in this country of US-based corporations in line with, uh, with our competitors in developed nations and developing nations around the world. So that's, so that's the positive. But the, um, not all businesses are receiving equal benefits, and I think it's important to point out, as, has, as was noted in the controller's testimony, that uh, some of the most important employers in the city, the law firms, the accounting firms, professional service firms, are not getting the pass-through advantages that will run to real estate and um, some of the uh, boutique financial operations. So I do think that uh, when we think about the implications, particularly with regard to the unincorporated business tax and how that will be treated, that those are going to be important things for the city council to focus on. Um, in the, in the uh, coming months. Um, although the, uh, no one really understands the detailed implications of the federal tax law yet, everyone's still struggling with it, so we're all kind of guessing at this. Um, obviously, the loss of state and local deductibility is the focus of most concern. Uh, residents of New York and nine other states are um, are in a situation where the loss of deductibility is a particular burden, and it's a and it's a burden, uh, not really on lower and what most people think of as middle class households, almost all of whom will be paying less overall in taxes because of rate reductions, child tax credits, and um, the increase in the standard deduction. So the burden falls on a relatively small number of people that should not be confused with those who are benefiting as a, 
corporations that are benefiting or pass through businesses that may be benefiting, which are a relatively select, um, select group on the corporate business side, but rather um, to the individuals that are going to be paying more. So there are about 60,000 tax filers in New York State uh, who earn over a million dollars in marginal income rates. Uh, between about half of those in New York City, most of them in downstate. We pay about 90% of the state's millionaire's tax just to, in, the down, in New York City in the downstate area. So that's, this, these are burdens falling squarely on New York City and its surrounding metro region. Um, those taxpayers are going to be uh, paying 52 to, in New York City, 57% of their income in state, federal, and local taxes post the PIT coming through. And this is, this is a significant um, impact on people thinking about what their, uh, what their situation is. The top 1% of tax filers are city residents who earn more than $700,000 account for about half of the city's income tax revenues. These are about 37,200 households that account for half our tax revenues. Um, and they are seriously going to be impacted and their decisions are being impacted. For anyone who doubts that, talk to the realtors in Florida. The, um, the competitiveness issue is what really is going to, what is going to hurt us more than the impact on the vast majority of taxpayers of this bill because it, it will be mostly neutral and positive. So what's going to hurt us is the fact that a family of four that earns $175,000, probably a two-income family, will pay 25% of their income in taxes in New York, but only 14% if they reside in Florida. So this is where the inequities come in. Uh, a family earning $750,000 will pay 40% of their income on taxes in New York versus 30% in Florida. So these are, um, these are substantial enough differences, and Florida is uh, multiplied by uh, 40 other states that have, will have substantially no or lower tax rates. So there will be an impact on employers. They will have to make decisions about paying their high earners paying people talent they want to attract from around the world more, or relocating jobs to lower tax locations, which include London, Paris, Germany, et cetera, lower tax locations. That will be, that will be a decision, and that affects our competitive position as a city. Uh, Governor Cuomo's proposals that I know you talked about today We've been looking at them for a couple months and trying to help with thinking through what are the possibilities, calling on experts to do that. Very difficult. One is you really don't know what the IRS is going to contest or not. And so it's speculative. And it's, um, and it's also difficult because the uh, you know, employers have to make a business decision about how to respond, and they, haven't, they really haven't seen enough details yet to respond to these proposals. So I don't have an answer, but what's important is the message the governor is sending, that we know this matters. We care about this. We can't afford to not be competitive for top talent. We can't afford the potential loss of people and jobs that could happen if we do nothing. So I think similarly to your hearing today, the important thing is for our elected officials to send the message, they understand this is a serious competitive issue for New York, for jobs and for people. And to take that issue seriously and to try and reach out as you are doing to business and to others to try and figure out what do we have to do about this and to deal with this not as a political or ideological issue, but as an economic uh, issue and the, in the interests of New York City and state, we really have to work together to get this right. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, to testify. Let's see what's on this one. No time. Ah, okay. Uh, so 
What I'm going to do today is a little different, is to review some of the research that tries to estimate what the effects of the elimination or the reduction in deductibility might be. A lot of this is research I've done over many years, uh, but uh, so uh, putting aside the uh, federalist uh, legal questions about deductibility, I see there are two main reasons to have uh, open-ended deductibility of state and local taxes. Uh, first, the cost of public services differs across cities and regions of the country. One estimate, and it's probably low, is that the costs are 20% higher in New York than elsewhere. Now, uh, someone in Washington might say, well, why are the costs higher? They're just spending too much, paying their public employees more. The costs are higher because New York, we, there's an enormous benefit from clustering economic activity together in what our gruesome sounding phrase from economics is agglomeration economies, uh, which leads to higher output, higher rates of innovation, higher rates of e economic growth, but it raises land prices and housing prices. So it's more expensive uh, to be close together. And I have a map here, which unfortunately you can't read, which shows this point vividly. You can't see it here, but I'm, if this map from the Commerce Department divides the economic activity of the United States, it's impossible to see, so I just, it just doesn't come out, uh, into two parts, 50-50. Uh, and 50% of the output uh, of the United States, and this is about 200, 2013, is produced in, uh, in a, about uh, one fiftieth of the area of the country, in a small number of metropolitan areas, of which New York uh, is an important one. Uh, so, and when you put this on the screen, it's very striking. So this is, cities and the metro areas are crucial to the productivity of the country, and this shows up in the tax system. It's often reported how, how much more we pay in taxes uh, than other places. Uh, and just some recent numbers I took from the 2015 federal data, average tax paid per return in New York State was uh, 18,600 versus 14,500 for the U.S. as a whole, 29% greater per return in New York State. And that's with deductibility. So where does that extra money come from? It's from that productivity of all these talented people clustered together uh, doing the things that make New York City and the New York metropolitan area uh, work. Uh, higher costs of living in large cities are also reflected in the differential cost of public services. Uh, to pay the basic services of government, you have to pay workers more, uh, it just costs more. And uh, did, so deductibility of state and lo ta local taxes is a way of taking into account these regional differences in the cost of public services. Now, you might say maybe what we should do is, since a dollar doesn't go as far in New York as in, uh, as in Kansas, we should have uh, adjust the federal rates to reflect that. There's no way to do that. So deductibility is a kind of second best way of taking account of differences in the cost of living. The second reason, this has been emphasized by almost all the speakers today, is that an important part of what New York does and California does is provide a ro relatively robust safety net. So the federal government, through deduct deductibility, is in effect purchasing more redistribution through its tax code. And I would argue it's a very efficient way to do it. The only, you want the local level of government to uh, provide homeless services, to decide what's the best uh, type of services for low-income elderly. Uh, and deductibility is a, is a kind of fiscal incentive to do that. Just as a little, uh, a little example, I just got a post from the Independent Budget Office, George has left, that shows that New York is now spending in 2017 almost one billion of its own money to provide shelter services for uh, families and single adults. One billion, now the budget's 88 billion, and you say oh, it's not much, it's a lot of money. And 
Some would say, well, that's what New York wants to do and let them do it, but we don't care. I don't think our values as a country really uh, agree with that. So that's, just, that's the second reason. Uh, now on the tax side is where I've done a lot of work. Deductibility is widely viewed. If you look at the numbers, they say, oh, well, the high income people get the biggest benefit from deductibility. They're much more likely to itemize and they uh, have higher marginal tax rates. But what I've done in my uh, economics research is to say, how do state tax systems adjust to the availability of the potential of deductibility? And what I've found, and some other studies support this, is that states respond to the, the incentives from deductibility by making their tax systems more progressive. So, uh, James is complaining that the New York system, tax system is regressive. Another way of looking at it is that they're more progressive than they would be because of this deductibility incentive. So again, to put it in the kind of federal language, the federal government is buying, is subsidizing progressivity through its uh, tax system, and the effects are substantial as well. Now, over time, every time there's a federal tax reform in the air, the first thing they go after is, let's get that deductibility of state and local taxes. Uh, and we beat it back in 86. We didn't this time. But the main thing that has chipped away at it has, of course, been the, the uh, growth of the alternative minimum tax rate, and um, alternative minimum tax system, which hits New York. Over 8% of filers are subject to that here versus 4% nationwide. And among people, I think as, as Catherine said, well, someone else said, among people in the 200,000 to 550 or so range, almost everyone is subject to that AMT. And the AMT, of course, is important because it treats state and local taxes as an expense item. So it takes away that incentive. Uh, now, so you might say, well, then it means deductibility doesn't matter very much. So here I think a finding in, in the simulations I've been working on the past few days, if you take all the filers in, in uh, New York State and you say, what, what is the effect on the, what we call, sort of the technical term, the marginal tax price uh, for tax taxpayers in New York? And what that means is how much does it cost taxpayers for an additional dollar of state and local taxes? One means you pay the full freight. 0.5 means half the cost gets shifted somewhere else. If you do this on, in terms of number of people, that number is 0.95. And that says that the reduction in the tax price is very small, only five cents on the dollar. But, and here's what I was astounded at, but it reflects how concentrated income is. If you weight by the income, the AGI of people in New York State, that tax price goes down from 0.95 to 0.75. And so what that means is that for every dollar of taxes that we raise, the deductibility, even with that AMT, that is, that's a deliberate political strategy to go at in New York again, but even with that, because there's so much income at the top, deductibility is still very important. So under the new bill, which caps deductibility at 10,000, at 10, the tax price will go from 0.75 up to one. And that's gonna be, it. so here's where economists, some say, well, it doesn't matter. Some say it does. My own view is that in the longer run, in the short run, what matters is, did my taxes go up or down? That's what I make my decision. But in the longer run, that marginal tax price, I think, matters a lot. An example would be what happened in the, in the Great Recession. In 2008, Governor Cuomo, along with governors in a couple of progressive states, raised the income tax, and that's what uh, kept, the, kept the services flowing, prevented sharp drops in state aid to cities, which many cities experienced. And he was able to do that. He didn't say it, but it was easier to do because, in effect, the federal government was sharing in the cost of that increase. And that's exactly what you want from a macro point of view, because they can run deficits. In fact, that's what Keynes says they should do. 
and we cannot at state levels. We're subject to a balanced budget constraint. So uh, I've probably taken uh, more time. My, my bottom line is, is with all the people here, this is very, it's very deleterious to New York's uh, fiscal system. It puts us at risk in many ways. And just, uh, I find I get puzzled by the proposed workarounds, but I would say that a bunch of the uh, very top tax, uh, their tax lawyers in the country are now, have been working on the charitable, de the charitable uh, deduction workaround. And a recent paper found that the, what they call full deductibility uh, is not a foreign concept in the U.S. tax system. Now, of course, uh, it's possible George uh, Sweeting, uh, he's not here anymore, but he was a political economist and said, aha, they're going to strike back if we try this. I don't know, but it seems to me reasonable for now until we can repeal and replace uh, this tax bill to try and think very carefully about that charitable contribution avenue. Thank you very much. Thank you also. And uh, next, please. Hello. First, thank you, Chairman, for allowing the Public Utility Law Project to testify. I believe this may be our first time doing this. My name's Rachel Bird. I'm the New York City staff person for the Public Utility Law Project. I'm here speaking on behalf of our executive director, Richard Berkeley. He was unfortunately able to make it, um, I believe there's a hearing on cybersecurity in the power grid um, in Albany today, something important enough to keep him there. Uh, clearly, most of the testimony that you're hearing today has to do with the problems and the um, awful impacts of this tax cut for the 1%. I'd like to spend a few moments on the unanticipated positive effects of the tax cut upon the city's utility ratepayers. I say unanticipated, by the way, since no doubt the windfall this legislation was intended to create took into account that utilities, unlike other corporations, pay their federal tax pay taxes with ratepayer funds. Therefore, when the utility's tax rate is lowered, the presumption is to, if you let me mention our hashtag here, give ratepayers their money back. When the regulated utilities want a rate increase, they must apply to the New York State Public Service Commission, or the PSC, to, uh, to explain what the funds, what the rate increase is for. Pulp signs up as a party because of the inevitable overcharge that they want to pass on to ratepayers and to challenge the size of their rate increase. Any utility in an active rate case, such as Niagara Mohawk, which is National Grid upstate, also, uh, which was in a rate case until January 26th, had to figure out the financial impact of lowering its federal tax rate from 35% to 20% and some, with some additional positive and negative adjustments for accounting treatment and depreciation changes. In the case of Niagara Mohawk, which originally requested an increase to customer rates of more than $300 million, the company saved more than $75 million in federal taxes that it had built into its new rates, and it removed that amount from its tax rating, from its rate increase. In the case of Central Hudson, a utility serving eight counties in the central Hudson Valley, a similar reduction in its rate case will come into effect when settlement talks are done. That's fairly close. And finally, in Orange and Rockland Utilities, which is a division of Con Edison, it reduced its proposed rate increase before it filed for new rates this year. Those were all active rate cases and it was relatively simp simple to do the math to figure out how to give ratepayers their money back. Companies in the middle of multi-year rate plans, such as Con Ed and National Grid New York City, are undergoing a less transparent and somewhat more difficult process. The reason for that is the following. First, there's a question of whether the utility should issue what's called a SIR credit during the rate plan or, second, if the utility should be allowed to retain the credit until the next rate case, 
which for Con Ed and National Grid should begin sometime in mid to late 2019. In addition, utilities also collect monies to pay taxes far into the future, which are called deferred taxes. So most important for ratepayers, the PSC began a proceeding on December 29, 2017, that is focused on dealing with how, do the, how the utilities should give ratepayers their money back based on the upfront tax cut. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this proceeding, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this proceeding 17-M-0815 will determine how to handle both the upfront federal tax reduction issue and how to treat the deferred taxes which could amount to billions of dollars in New York State that could either be returned to ratepayers or invested in a manner that benefits ratepayers. And that is where the action will be. Pulp is a party to that proceeding and will be fighting, <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that ratepayers get their money back. The governor and the PSC put out a press release in early January stating that the state's policy would be to return net benefits to ratepayers. The big challenge will be in defining what net benefits are, are and should be. As part of the proceeding, the PSC staff will issue a white paper that addresses this issue. The definition of net benefits, both in the paper and in parties' comments on it, will strongly affect the Commission's decision on the most equitable way to deal with this money. For example, should the money be returned to ratepayers over the next 10 or 20 years, creating a strong pressure to hold rates down into the foreseeable future? Should the utilities return the deferred tax collections to ratepayers in a big sur credit? Or would it be prudent to use a small yet vital percentage of those monies on expenditures on safety or resiliency measures aimed at lowering the impact of the next Superstorm Sandy or Hurricanes Irene or Lee? Or the potential uses for these monies are many, and it will be a significant focus of these PSC proceedings. Pulp will be in that proceeding representing the city's and the state's most vulnerable ratepayers, and will be happy to report back to the council or the committee, and or the committee, or answer any questions as this issue moves along. Again, thank you for the chance to testify here. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for coming in. Uh, let me just start off with a question on um, out-migration of high-skilled persons. Uh, Mr. Parrott, in your estimation, is there a significant concern for New York City? So um, <clears throat> in, in looking at the best research, which I was pleased to see was cited in the council's, uh, in the council's briefing paper on this, um, it, it appears that uh, other factors uh, trump, uh, sorry to use that term, uh, trump state and local taxes as a factor in determining locations. So people's connection to local business and social networks are, are very important, more important than, than differential taxes. Um, but I'm not sure how relevant those studies are to the situation we're in now, because it is, I think it is significantly different. So we, we do need to be um, mindful of that and monitor that. I don't take it for granted that the, the lack of sort of net out migration because of higher state local taxes in New York has not been a determining factor in the past, is not gonna, is not gonna prevail go, going forward. But I guess we also need to keep in mind that, that many of the high income people who may be paying a high marginal rate in New York, higher than in other, other places, are not necessarily seeing their taxes go up as a result of the federal tax cut. Some of them might have been beneficiaries of significant tax reduction. So, so how, in an environment where maybe their marginal taxes are, are more out of line than what they were before, but they're also, their after-tax income is greater than it was before. So Kathy might be, you know, well positioned to speak to that. So, so it, it's something I think that we need to keep an eye on. Um, and the past research, which is important to keep in mind, you know, may not apply as well as we would like it to going forward. 
So I think what I heard you say was that uh, businesses might be more negatively, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, that um, personal income tax uh, would be more negatively impacted than the business taxes. Well, certainly, I mean, there's uh, pretty significant reductions in the in the corporate tax, and there's, uh, I don't think there's a great state difference in how the corporate tax is playing out. Um, on, but, it, but it is a factor on the personal income tax side, although, again, it's in the context of many people at the very top receiving uh, net uh, federal tax reductions. Who are those? Um, well, many people who are uh, some people, real estate investors, other investors who are able to take advantage of the pass-through uh, uh, credit, people who own a lot of corporate shares, uh, we're seeing a lot of corporate buybacks and increase in dividends. I'm sure we'll see a lot of increase in dividend payouts as a result of the corporate tax cut and so on. So, so the modeling from, say, the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy that I referenced in, in my uh, attached figure one uh, indicate that, you know, many people in the top 1 percent, the top 5 percent will receive significant net tax breaks as a result of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Ms. Moyle? I just, I think um, many does not mean substantial numbers or most. Um, we're talking about a pool of people that includes scientists, doctors, uh, entertainers, Wall Street, corporate executives. So we're talking about a pool of people that are not, I, I couldn't agree with James Moore, real estate investors made out like fat rats on this thing. But, um, but in terms of people who earn a wage, who represent a huge amount of economic activity in our city and are really the nuts and bolts uh, of what makes our city uh, a magnet for global talent, almost all will be both getting a increase in their taxes as a result of this and we'll be seeing a huge differential between if they live or work in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, because New Jersey and Connecticut are kind of on a par with us, or very close, or if they're in Texas or Florida or London, which has greatly reduced their rates, or other European capitals. So, and the problem is not wealthy people leaving because there is a entrenchment here until they get to the point of estate taxes and retire. Uh, but it is attracting. And as our economy has shifted from top-down corporate to increasingly entrepreneurial bottom-up with the tech economy, you're talking about we have to attract the entrepreneurs and the employees, this talent base here. We have, uh, have 130,000 job openings at the city on any given day these days, and these are the high-tech, engineering, high-skilled jobs. And that's where it gets really concerning, because there's a momentum to establishing ourselves. I mean, in the 90s up to 2002, we were a joke as a tech capital. Today, it's the fastest growing part of our economy. We can't jeopardize that, and I don't think any of us understands what the implications are for venture capital funded businesses in terms of the implications of this act. And so that, I just think there are a lot of dynamics here that we have to take very seriously. I don't think there's any easy answers, and I don't think history provides us with a lesson because our economy has changed so much as, a res, as a well as this dramatic anti-New York, anti-blue state bias in the federal tax law, that we're in a new territory and you're right to be holding a hearing on it. Uh, I think the number was thrown about of about 60,000 in uh, high income uh, tax earner, uh, income earners. Um, of those 60,000, how many would be in the real estate and pass through uh, category and how many would be in the entertainment uh, you know, tracked wage earners? I think, um, I, don't, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows right now what the answer to that question is, but just if you take in New York City, we have 300,000 people working on Wall Street, about half of them would be in that category. 
Um, and the most affected are not the employees of public corporations, but the employees of boutique in smaller investment firms, because we've had a reduction in large banks. We've got many more smaller financial activities going on. So we've got, we've got this dramatic change in our economy. And I would, I think the distinction here, as James did make in his clarification, is that yes, we have a wealthy population that are not wage earners. They're not the doctors. They're not the scientists. Um, they're, uh, that, that are earning money off investment and wealth or real estate. They are served well by this. That's very true. That's not what's building the, I mean, the real estate industry benefits by the creation of a life science industry in town or the tech industry. But they're the beneficiaries of it. They're not creating it. And I think we have to look at the people that are creating the next generation of economic activity and jobs and see what's happening to them. And that's who we're focused on. Thank you. Professor uh, Turnick, you had mentioned, I think, in your testimony also, why wouldn't, uh, you said, this, I think it was you who said some companies wouldn't want to opt into the payroll deduction uh, option. Was that, was, that, was that you who said that? Was it Kathy? Microphone, please. It depends what the details are, and what a company will do is look at, is it better for me to increase the compensation that I'm offering the people I'm trying to recruit, or should I opt in to neutralize the tax bill? The truth is um, that the proposal is set forward where companies would have to um, take the responsibility for everybody earning 40000 and up, that's an attempt to make this kind of a middle class deal. It's not a middle class deal, I mean, unless you consider 500000 middle class. This is an upper class deal problem. And companies will be spending their own money to make up for, really it's, it's so they can attract this top tier talent that's going to be hurt by the tax bill. And that's the negotiation that's going on. And, and that's, but if you say all your employees who earn 40000 and up, that's going to be, um, that's a lot of people that aren't being hurt by the tax bill that the company will be having to take tax responsibility for. So I don't think that's likely to happen. But politically to say we're going to do this for millionaires is also not very attractive. Let me just ask, because we had to be out of the room in about three, three minutes. Um, what about the impact on home values? Um, uh, care to comment on that, Professor Turner? Uh, I, I've seen the, um, yeah, I've seen the 10 percent estimate. Uh, and a friend of mine, an economist at University of Chicago, Illinois, has produced a similar back of the hand estimate. And uh, that, that, sounds, uh, that sounds plausible. I think the, the, the Again, it's the concentration or it's relatively small number of very high-valued homes or apartments or condominiums in Manhattan, Brooklyn, I have to say, uh, that would fall, be subject to this. And one would, one would expect a, a reaction there. I, I don't think that really increases, I guess I beg to defer, someone, maybe it was James, with affordability because people in how much they're willing to pay, they take account of the the purchase price, the mortgage, the monthly. So what this is doing would be if they can't deduct anything above, say, 775,000, I believe is the limit now, that increases the monthly uh, cost to buy a $1.5 million apartment if you're not financing it. And uh, so people, so the price may fall, but the net cost, I don't think, Changes. It's far Very less much. than the values went up with the construction of the Second Avenue subway on the east side. So, you know, take your, pick your poison. If, if I could just say the, the, the problem here, what we're all confronting, is, the, is, is, is this, that this is uncharted territory, both statistically and even in our way of thinking about it. Uh, and just to use my number, the marginal tax price, usually, you know, it might change by two or three percent, two or three points. But to go up by that much, we, we just don't know. One, there very, one reaction might be to, that the politics of New York changes and the current tax system is no longer 
uh, supported by a majority of people or by the people who don't. We, we don't know. Other reactions are on the, po the people moving in that uh, Catherine talked about, about uh, people moving out. And again, the evidence on that has been uh, that New York, despite its high taxes and progressive tax system, has been extraordinarily successful economically. In my own research, states that have more progressive tax systems and more generous public benefit systems have not been hurt at all in their economic growth uh, over time, but that's with small changes. So we, we just don't know here. Okay, so we have a lot more to learn as we move forward. I want to thank you all for coming in. Thank and you for very much. Testimony, and uh, with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned at four. Uh, excuse me, at three fifty-six. Thank you.